A spade is known for many uses and consequently different names. However, despite the name, form or use it is known or goes by. Here on The Advocate, we call it by its name, a spade. Welcome to another No Oats Bad edition of your favorite program on Plus TV Africa, The Advocate. Today, my advocacy is on how everything in Nigeria is tailored to stress you, even down to your favorite musician beefing each other. Anyone here is asking a very important question about what Africa and Nigeria needs in terms of living and minimum wages. Ferdinand, not the defender, who, makes his debut today on the show and is here to tell us about what life would look like in a post-oil economy in Nigeria. According to Leo Tolstoy, the sole meaning of life is to serve humanity. Finally, Kemak is telling us a story that shows the humanness and thoughtfulness in our daily living. Sit back. The panelists are here to present your Sunday dose of provoking thoughts after this break. Everything in Nigeria is going to kill you. The anointed musical beef and the Lagos local government election. It was my learned friend, Dr. Ayo Shogunro, who wrote the book, Everything in Nigeria is Going to Kill You. He wrote, my relentless pursuit of, un of an understanding of the survivability of the average Nigerian in a system that is definitely dysfunctional. Some of us complain. Some of us protest. Some of us go spiritual and see many others go material. And also a few of us turn to the arts of solace. We write not to cure other people of madness, but to avoid going mad ourselves. He introduced the book to me at a bar somewhere in Ilupeju in Lagos. I think I bought in solidarity, but as a Christian, I believe in the power of words, so I did not read it. I cannot locate the book now. Judging by the title, it seems the writer is right after all. If you are lucky to escape the physical arm, recent happening will deaden your humanity and feeling. A friend reported how he was robbed at gunpoint. He laughed while narrating the story. His audience also laughed. Many videos on social media have shown where people get robbed in broad daylight at Akwangbon, Eco Bridge, Lekki Ekwe Expressway, Agege, even at the Federal Capital Territory of Abuja. The house of the Chief of Staff to the President was robbed right at the heart of the most secured premises in our country. Police stations have been attacked and policemen and women killed. Police, oh! The politics is in shambles, security is nowhere, nobody is talking about to strike again. Our consciences are fading away. Is Nigerian killing us? Is Nigerian killing our humanity? Away from all the problem around, let us relax a bit. Last week was the week of anointed musical beef on the song. Like most of the views that have been expressed on the subject, I stand against the direct diss by Evangelist Okwe Alabi. I stand with Adenyeka Alasheyori, whose name I now know, thanks to the evangelist. Beef between musicians is not uncommon. Those in the hip hop world will not easily forget Tupac and Biggie Beef. They both paid with their lives. The jury is still out there, whether it was the beef that occasioned their de eventual death. Nigeria has its fear of lyrical wars and beefs amongst its musicians. For those who could remember the interesting war between late Alaji Sikirwa in the Barista and General Kolinti Anyela, you go fear titles. Whilst Alaji Agba was measured in his lines, General took no prisoners in his lyrical attacks on Barista. There were negative undercurrents between King Sonia Ade and now Evangelist Ebenezer Obi. They were in the habit of denying beef, but their talking drummers and guitarists were always quick to contradict them at the slightest opportunity with invectives, hidden in sounds of drums and guitars. Said Oshukpa, aka Saridon P, Saridon Papa, Oshukpa, or King of Music, has his long drum battle with Wasio Alabi Pasuma, aka GSM Alaji, Popsi Aliya, Baba Wasila, Omo Yawa Anobi. This was further taken to the streets, and the fans were often violent. Lost in between is the beef between two face and face. The beef between Davido and Whiskey is nothing new. 
Yes, it's extreme violence, but of course, e-violence on Twitter and Instagram. I heard rumors about beefs between the double legend Osita Osadebe and Oliver the Coke. Thus, beef in the gospel music world is just another with anointing. Of course, I side with Adeni Kala Shiori, the subject of the diss from Evangelist Tokwe Alabi. Please, don't let the Nigerian factor kill you, your conscience, humanity, or humanness. Join the gossip. It's interesting. The good side is that you will not be wrong. Before I forget, the Lagos State local government election is near. Please participate. It is your right. It is your obligation. <laughs> <laughs> I must say that I, I, I had to hold my... I really had to... That was quite an interesting one, I must say. And I, the way we went from the gospel artist to... The secular artist was quite interesting, but I do find it slightly, should I say, I mean, I don't want to sound really aggressive, but I do find it slightly distasteful that at some point, because of the religious connotations, I believe that there could have been some decorum and some better handling of the crisis between Evangelist Sokwe Alabi and, what's her name? Alashiori. Ala, Ali, Ala I believe that if you've had something to say to her, there might have been better ways to handle it. But then who knows, that may just be my opinion. And she may have done what she felt was directed of her to do. Who am I to talk about it? Well, I, to, to speak to this, I think that when it comes to um, the territory, there will always be beef. Um, and in a sense, growing up with, back in the day with Tupac and Biggie and just seeing what had played out, you understand that you can't always run away from it. But this particular incident, I see the context of it around the IP. And if you're talking about an IP infringement, there are legal ways to pursue that. But I also, in a sense, think about it. In most of us, I'll be doing songs that were raised on even modern, modern day musicians. Have they ever bothered to ask who wrote it? And how long are these IPs available for? And if you want to do someone's song, maybe get it right. But again, to, to a claim for IP is not something you throw out on social media. I think there are legal ways to express that. But in this case... Okay, I don't think it was a case of intellectual property. But the truth is, I don't... I count that, at the risk of sounding arrogant, I count it so beneath me to even have an opinion about that. Because as far as I'm concerned, I have little to no respect for Tokwe Alabi, whoever it is. I really do not... I won't even bother justifying that crap with a comment of mine. That's just how I feel about it. And well, well, that yeah, man, that's, a, that is another that's, that's dimension a, to yeah, it. Yeah, that's, that's but, then, exactly but then I would say know. to talk to what Fedi has said, I really think that in this particular case, Tokwe Labi was very vocal from what I read, that she believes that it wasn't an, it was a Holy Spirit inspired song, that that wasn't what it was. And that, you know, the only duro that is my guarantor in English, the person who stands behind me, it should know that you can't, you can't diminish God and place you him see, as your guarantor. You see, and I'm editor, thinking, where I have seriously? a problem, you see, my problem with you know, religion, there was a claim. particularly in this part of the world, is the disgusting, uh, 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 self deluded interpretation of what God is and who God is. And people trying to force their personal opinions mm. down the throats of the gullible mm. but spiritually blind followers and following. So, like I said, I don't even want to go into... I think it's beneath me, mentally I, I, I and intellectually, think, think, to talk think, about who is right think, or who is wrong. Uh, I you know, you know, will not buy into think, that. Thinking um, about it, I, I think the, the, point, the, point, the point you're making is even bigger than just what we're discussing. Uh, there is the context of saying that we live mm. in a society that is highly religious, but short on spirituality. Fantastic. So people are caught up in just following the treadmill, mm -hmm. going after exactly. and regurgitating what other people are saying. But spirituality, it's every human, every human has a sense of coming into their own awareness of spirituality. And I think the customization and imposing a particular model as a way to express spirituality, it's really not going to carry us through into the future. I mean, it's more than anything else. Religion will always break. Religion cannot sustain us. So, but again, when you look at it in, in any context, is it, is it worth our conversation? So the reason absolutely why it's worth our, not absolutely it is worth our conversation because it takes me away from all the problems of Nigeria. Oh, as an escape route. Uh, yes, yes. And Francis is an escape, to is a, is an escape strategy. And, and, and to, to tell you the truth, it, it takes away... So the person I was talking about was my colleague in the office and his car broke down. He joined the bus and he was robbed. And 
he was laughing about the whole story and it was funny to everybody. And when I laughed, something, when something, something when hit I me, hmm. like, we're really losing our humanity. So, indeed, the writer friend of mine is right when he hmm. said everything in Nigeria will kill you. It may not kill you physically, oh, but... Wow. So, talking about the musical abuse and the ones that's got the anointing now, is the escaping strategy. <laughs> well, and I'm wondering, as Nigerians, how long we're going to keep escaping and what we're actually going to do. But then it's a good escaping strategy, I must say, and interesting... It's, I don't think so. Unleashed. It's not sustainable because it draws you deeper into a, a, a greater sense of confusion mm. and commotion. Well, but sad. anyhow, let's just move it along. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we keep the ball rolling. Yes. Up next is Anita. And she wants to tell us what Nigeria needs as regards living wages. Anita, over to you. Living wages, what do Nigerians need? The question of living wages is arguably an interesting one in Africa, and more so in a country like Nigeria. But then, what do we mean by living wages? According to Investopedia, a living wage refers to a theoretical income level that allows individuals or families to afford adequate shelter, food, and other necessities. The goal of a living wage is to allow employees to earn enough income for a satisfactory standard of living and prevent them from falling into poverty. Economists suggest that a living wage should be substantial enough to ensure that no more than 30% of it gets spent on housing and this amount will often be substantially higher than the legal minimum wage. However, there are various arguments for and against the living wage narrative. Those that are in support of living wages argue that paying employees higher salaries offer benefits to the company. Our staff are more satisfied and this reduces staff turnover. Other benefits would include high morale of the staff, which in turn results in more productive staff, as well as increased output from the staff of the company. When turnovers are reduced, the company does not have to engage in expensive recruitments and frequent training or retraining of new staff. The workflow is also seamless and company culture can be preserved. But those who are not in favor of living wages say that the implementation of a living wage creates a wage flow which harms the economy eventually. Also, fewer employees are hired if the company has to pay higher wages and the end result is higher unemployment because you have deadweight loss and people who would willingly have worked for less than a, willing, than a living wage will not be given an opportunity to get the job. Now, away from the arguments for and against, what does the law have to say about living wages? In Nigeria, what we have prescribed is a requirement to pay minimum wages, which is not even fully implemented by organizations. There are, however, different international instruments on the issue of living wages, some of which are, one, the, Uni Universal, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was proclaimed by the United Nations General Assembly on 10 December 1948, and in Article 25, it states, Everyone has a right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and of his family, including food, clothing, housing, and medical care, and necessary social services, and the right to security in the event of employment, sickness, disability, widowhood, old age, or other lack of livelihood in circumstances beyond his control. Other instruments that talk about living wages include the Ethical Trading Initiative Base Code, which is widely acknowledged as a model code of labor practice and is derived from the conventions of the International Labor Organization, ILO. We also have the International Labor Organization, ILO C131, 
Minimum Wage Fixing Convention 1970, number 131, as well as the International Convention on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. So why is the issue of living wage rising on the global agenda? One, there is a rising phenomenon of the working poor. That is working people who are unable to make ends meet because wages are too low. Two, there is the issue of the increasing gap between national minimum wages and cost of living, which is not going anywhere anytime soon. Then three, we have the continued development of international standards for business and ethics, which is changing the dynamics of human dignity. At the end of the day, however, it's really maybe not just about the money, but about the choices that money allows you to have. My questions then are, do Nigerians need a living wage or a minimum wage? If we do need a living wage, is this a possible reality? I think I'll dive in first. We first need to live. Mm. Because the first word of the phrase is living hmm. than wage. So in terms of what we need in Nigeria, the government should just help us, assist us, make sure that we are alive. If they can guarantee that, then we cannot talk of the wage. See, the minimum wage that, we, that is prescribed by the Minimum Wage Act today is not even enough to make you live. The 30,000 naira cannot buy a bag of rice. And if bag of rice is the only thing you're going to buy, you need other things to add to it Correct. To, to make it, co <laughs> it consumable. Now, mm. now, now, the standard, the life itself, the quality of life is reducing by the day. Mm. So the place to start from is even make us expect to wake up tomorrow. Mm. Then... Food is the next thing, and I love food so much. <laughs> it's not showing. It's not showing. <laughs> ah, well. <laughs> food security mm. all over the country. When we are able to tackle that security of life and property, then food security so that whatever you earn, you are sure you have something to fill your belly. You know, I think the issue of minimum wage and living wage, yes. in my um, humble estimation, when you look at minimum wage, it tells you the least amount yes, so someone of a particular pay grade, you yes. know, can, so rather educational qualification or whatever the metrics are for determining your entry level yes. or, you know, the level you can rise to in your career, the very least amount you can earn based on the certification you have. But I, I would say a living wage has more to do with what... what um, offer you bring to the table it's not really limited to uh, your your educational qualification but rather it looks at your standard of living okay, the, the yes. bare the barest essentials yes. that you need to yeah, have yeah. you know so in a sense you see nigeria we're still grappling with so much yes. even the minimum wage has not been ratified by all the states there are several reasons why different um, state governments are arguing that they can't pay the wage, even those that have agreed to pay the wage that, that seem able to pay the wage and not even, you know, doing it and the, the wages are not coming as at when due. So it's um, all of this falls back to entrepreneurship development, in my honest opinion. Individuals should be able to rise up and look within, discover what traits, talents and abilities they have, and then plan strategically how to translate those from ability to monetized services that would, I mean, just loosen you up financially and make you not dependent, so to speak, on a system for daily bread, whether it's a place of employment or, you know, government policy. But even as an entrepreneur, government policy does have an impact on your ability or the skill at which you earn and all of that. So really, it's... Um, I would say it's an egg and chicken situation. analogy situation, okay. if you will. Okay, if I'm going to add to this, I think that the minimum, idea of minimum wage was not supposed to limit the potential or the capacity of the citizens. Mm. It was basically to ensure that at least there's a standardization of some yes. sort. Mm. Now, but there are many things to consider here. First of all, inflation, 
Mm -hmm. um, and if you look at the last um, two, three years, inflation is now double digits. So what, if you were buying a bag of rice for 9,000 naira, you're almost buying times two now. Mm. So you're, you're, there are other things we're dealing with, but the, the, the minimum wage or the living wage is not rising just as high as the exactly. inflation in the right. exactly. So that, that there is an erosion of value, right? But That's one it. thing is that we know government can't by themselves create jobs. We've mm -hmm. always advocated mm -hmm. an enabling environment to allow for the jobs. Right. So yeah. an entrepreneur today can't even get access to capital. Uh, is, is the CBN giving loans? You bet you need collateral. Is the Bank of Industry giving loans? You bet you need collateral. Mm. And how many Nigerian businesses mm. truly, genuinely afford, can afford to collateral? Except for the big guys who have been in oil all our lives. And, and again, so we can't necessarily begin to talk about living wage when the circumstances or the environment that can allow for the living wage... It's not even there. Yeah, it's not even there. Mm. You know? And then with, well, one of my greatest challenge is looking at how much the governors earn for security votes, how much the National Assembly and <laughs> no, the House of Reps... There, right? It's no, such a bloated... No, it's just a bloated figure. Those guys are, are robbing us in daylight. You but at the end of the day, they will struggle to approve a 30000 naira minimum wage. That's now they are the going problem. home with an entire local government budget every month. Right. Right. Security it's really, really what they say. So my own particular advocacy is that... We, when are we going to wake up and attack this bloated government and let them end like civil servants? Interesting, Ferdinand, that those are your views. And now Ferdinand is telling us to prepare for a post-oil economy after this break. So we're talking about preparing for a post-oil economy. Now, experts are saying by 2030, which is exactly nine years from now, Nigeria will enter a post-oil age. For decades, we have actually failed to translate the wealth in the oil economy into the development of the common man. So I, you can imagine that this is scary when you think about Nigeria without oil, and we're still pretty much largely a mono-economy. So what does this mean when we talk about an oil economy going away? It means job losses. It means increased poverty. But guys, I really want us to think of something else. Apart from just feeling afraid that with all the oil wealth, unemployment is still at 5% and is really, really high. And that's contest contestable. It could even be way higher than that. So post-oil economy, it's something we need to talk about. But here is the interesting part, guys. There is a good news, even in the seemingly bad news. We have to realize the opportunity a post-oil economy affords us. There is an opportunity to truly diversify an economy as 2030 approaches. So our biggest threat is not that oil will run out or that the world will stop buying oil, but rather our inability to capitalize on this fast-rushing wave of innovation to rewrite the destiny of the nation come 2030. So at this crucial junction, I think for me, one of the important things we must understand that innovation is going to be the determinant factor here if we're going to survive in the future. It's expected that the post-industrial economy will be a creative economy. And in every family, there's a creative person. I mean, we're in the age of the creative economy, but think about it for a second. The structures that can drive the creative economy is not even there. Many creative people cannot find a enabling environment to produce either songs or their movie. Everyone is running around. The fashion ones cannot actually scale because the economy and the structure to help them scale is not even there. So the creative economy makes up about $2.2 trillion in revenues and about 30 million plus jobs globally. So it is the fastest growing segment in the world. Creative industries are recognized as a source of innovation, economic growth, personal well-being, community cohesion. Like, think about it. The creative economy is the future. If we want to attack unemployment, we cannot not talk about the creative economy. So economic success on a level requires that we have to harness our creative economy. We have to put it together, the structures, the policies that can drive them, protect our IPs, put piracy laws in place so people can thrive. Now, according to the National Bureau of Statistics, I think this report was in 2016. They said that our GDP, as of 2015, about 94.14 trillion came from um, the creative sector. Like further analysis of this data from the report indicates that the sector could, even with the state of it is, which is not structured, informal, can contribute a way more than we can actually see. In the US, it's about 5.3% com coming from the creative sector. So with music going global, and all the streaming platforms, with movies going global, with fashion going global, we cannot begin to, to undermine the potential in that segment. So my, my, my advocacy today is to really ask the question, now what are we doing with the music? What are we doing from art to entertainment, to recreation, the stories that we have, 
Most of us grew up reading literature. Those things can actually rival international movies. They can become series. They can become feature films globally. And they can make money because they're exportable. So guys, I'm talking about this huge potential within the creative sector that we're not tapping as a country. We complain about unemployment being high. And of course, it's going to remain high for a long time because unemployment, they don't go away. There's something called cyclical unemployment, which is that at the end of the day, with innovation, some jobs will be dis dissolved. Jobs will go. Innovation will swallow up jobs. But how do we position our educational sector so it can create? I'm talking about how we can strip down our economic model, our educational model, and actually allow innovation to drive. Some courses have no business being studied in the world today. If blockchain is the, is the backbone of the industrial age, the fourth industrial revolution, why is blockchain not part of our cu curriculum? But our government is placing a ban on cryptocurrency, on anything that looks like blockchain. They're regulating the, 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 uh, the, the fintech space. But this is where they're supposed to be putting the best foot forward to ensure that we have enough jobs for our young people. If we kill innovation, we've killed the future. Oil is not going to be around that much. And it's good news for me because people who go to power because they want to be able to get easy access to contracts can no longer go. Now, despite high informal sector, the creative economy still has a lot of potential. This inactive state is due to structural gaps, and we can fix that. Policies, theories, we can do that. Conferences, programs that can help drive that space. Guys, I think we need a new generation of revolutionary thinkers, artists, producers, writers, who can create this compelling story of a new Nigeria. We are not just here. Nigeria is the dream. We are the Nigerians. If this country will arise, if there will be jobs, we have to do it ourselves. I mean, people can go to Canada, but not all of us can go to Canada. There is more potential here. The resources are here. How do we harness that? We have resources, but are we resourceful? If you're creative, I'll say welcome to the world. Your time has come. I think that I would wow. like to take you right on in that. You see, a very, very interesting advocacy, I must say. But the challenge that I have with what we, what this kind of narrative, which is going across in different places, is that when we galvanize all the emotions, what are the solutions? What is the way forward? What is it that is being done? So we, you have whipped up quite a lot of sentiments and people. The creative sector is there. And you've listed the big boxes is right in that system. But what is going to be done? Who is going to wake up and say, let's start guiding ourselves? We have over 200 million people. And I, over 50% of those are young people. Mm. So can somebody tell me why the creative sector is not doing better than it's doing? Are we still waiting for government? I have a, I have a real challenge with the fact that government needs to do something. And I'm not saying that the government or policies are not faulty or that mm -hmm. there are issues. But have you ever thought of that? Um, was it, who was it that? Have you ever thought of what the power of a small group of determined people can do? I don't think we're determined enough for what you're advocating for. I told you, when I was younger, my, my mom could not even allow me to write or, or become a writer because how are you going to pay the bills? If you are a musician, how are you going to survive? No, that is changing. We're seeing our That's musicians. a total paradigm shift. And yeah. you know uh, what, what, what you said? But the government really, is not catching it, up it with it. really hit home. I remember as, I think I was in GS3, the first time I picked up a jam brochure, my eldest brother was writing jam. And so I flipped through, of course then it was this bulky book that, hundreds of pages, and then I got, I'll never forget, I got to University of Calabar, and I saw theatre arts. Mm -hmm. And that course jumped out of the page, literally, and hit me in my soul, and I blotted out, I'm going to study theatre arts. You switched? The moment I made that statement, my mom was sitting in the living room and she said, God bless her soul. And she said, No, she just said, Let your father hear you. Oh and goodness. that killed, yes, yes. you know. And then I had to struggle through the sciences mm. because they wanted me to study medicine. And you know the fun, and it's very funny. While in primary school, I was in a drama and I played the role of the doctor. And everybody told me, My God, you did it so well. You're going to be a good doctor when you grow up. <laughs> Meanwhile, they ought to have told me you could you're going to be a good doctor. actor. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So, I mean, back to what you're saying, Eniton. The beautiful thing about the creative industry, you really you need very little external motivation mm. or push mm -hmm. to rise up where you are with what you have and begin to run. There, there is also need for policy policy push. Oh, definitely. You see, in Nigeria, your your business, your idea is likely to die. Not by competition mm -hmm. or lack of funds or profit, but by government regulation and policies. Mm. So you are likely to be regulated out of business mm. before True. any factors mm. coming from within or from your competitors. So is, there, there, there used to be a very big industry in this country, the VAS sector. 
That is the uh, value added services in the telephonic, talking about callback tones, book SMS. Mm -hmm. Those have been regulated out of NCC business. NCC killed it, yeah. Mm -hmm. What did he say? NCC, they killed it. I know. But I just wanted you to echo it. This is what, those are the things that will happen to the creative industry. So we need to go back to the basis. You see, when you take all of this to the National Assembly, to the State House of Assembly, I'm telling you, 80% of the time, mm. they will never understand you. We go back to the thumb printing, your right. votes, Correct. the people that represent you, the policy mm. maker, the people that are going to drive the policy that, that will affect will you, this creative sector. So I, I tell you most sincerely that politics determines everything. And I will always say Correct. it. Politics is too important to be left to the politicians. Correct. Alone. It's going to affect every other thing. And it's yeah, what I agree. No, I guess, no, because you see. Something different. <laughs> no, I, I, I agree with what you gentlemen have said. But one thing I have come to understand is that there's got to be a high level of, like I was discussing before we went on the show, there has got to be a way where we made psychology and strategy. There was a particular movie that I watched about a lady, a lobbyist in the United States, and it has forever changed my mind. It was titled Miss Sloan. I don't know how one woman single-handedly was able to penetrate into the American, American legal system and be able to influence policy. So I think that one thing that we don't push or fight for or talk about in Nigeria is how we can actually get and penetrate politicians. I'm not saying that we're going to, there's something called lobbying. Most people want to physically be the person who is a frontliner mm. or say, how do you actually change policies? You know, until, until we move our politics in Nigeria from a patriarchal or um, god worshipper system mm. to the point where politicians are answerable to the electorate. Like the recent um, um, hoopla that happened on June 12th, Democracy Day, and people went on the streets, you know, ranting that the president has to go and all that. I just looked at it and I said, okay, this is still, we're still having PTSD from the military era. Yes. You don't unseat a sitting president through, you know, um, going protesting and no, all that. You don't. He has the, the mandate. Is the protest. He has the mandate. He has the votes. The constitution backs him. The only thing that can remove a sitting democratically elected president is death or impeachment. So rather than go on the streets and shout and make a whole lot of noise, begin to lobby your representatives that's it. at the state and that at the it. national that is exactly level. That's what now, just give me a minute. By the time you do that and then begin to threaten that person, if you want Im impeachment, for example, let you your people, your people. Ch you channel it through them. Let them bring it up to the house so that it's up for debate. And then you, put, you can even threaten or blackmail that person, quote unquote, if you don't get this on your own seat. It's not, you see, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, politics is a game of selfish interest. That's it. Right? But like I keep saying, until we move the way a political system is mm. from the place of rank adede to a place of I'm sending you there, these are my expectations based on the law. We'll keep running around in circles and nothing will get you, done. You have a good point. And I think everything rises and falls on the, the knowledge of the people in every mm. society. And like I said, protest is therapeutic but it doesn't translate always. Mm, uh, yes, so it's just a correct. tactic. We need a strategy. Mm. Fantastic. Guys, we're going to go on a quick break, and after that, Kemak will come back to give us a life lesson. You want to hang around? The monsters we make. Indeed, life does teach us a thing or two about being a brother's keeper. And while it's a dog eats dog world where everybody is looking like lunch, I take this opportunity to advocate the need for humaneness and thoughtfulness in our dealings with our fellow man by recounting this personal tale. Years ago, during my undergraduate days, I started an event and venue styling business as a side hustle. A client of mine, Jessica by name, took me to her wedding reception venue. She was super excited and like most brides, wanted perfection. She settled for an Arabian princess theme in her favorite color, pink, and she hired my services, certain I wouldn't disappoint. There was a decor supply store right close to the reception venue and a quick drop by revealed that they had really beautiful pink table leanings 
that I thought would be a great addition to styling Jessica's venue. After small talk with the business owner, I inquired about the rental price for the table leanings and the shop attendant told me the rental cost in presence of her madam. I made reservations and gave them the date of my event and left. The pink table leanings were exquisite. I was eager to have them add a lot of panache to Jessica's venue styling. On the day of the wedding, after the decor had been done, everywhere was fabulous. The final touch to jazz up the space was the table leanings and I hurriedly made for the store to get them. I walked in briskly. Now every decorator understands the urgency of getting a hall ready before guests begin to arrive. I greeted the madam and hurriedly called out to the shop girl to let me have 60 of the table leanings. I was a bit taken aback when the madam got up from her usual seat and moved towards myself and the shop girl. I had the agreed amount for the 60 leanings and handing that over to the shop girl, her madam asked, how much is that? I responded and she said, no, it's X Naira. And the amount she called was six times the agreed amount. I was dumbstruck, mouth agape. I thought to myself, what a shark. What sort of human took advantage of another person at such a precarious moment? I was at the point of tears, literally. Well, I'm a fighter and I can never, never be leveraged. So I squared my shoulders and walked out of her shop. I would rather spend 10 times more buying leaning from the market than getting her leaning at her horrible price. A couple years later, I'm heading up a project looking to hire the decor services of this same woman for a job that may very well change her fortunes. Isn't life funny? I often tell people who care to listen that life is just life. And the hand that you deal another will very likely serve you in double fold. While it is in my power to exact revenge, I choose the high road of unbiased fairness in making a decision of who to hire. Thankfully, I am not a monster. Rather, she did not make me into a monster. <laughs> that was quite noble of you, Kate, right. I must say. I'm not sure I'm that no I would have been editor. quite that magnanimous. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I doubt it, but that was really good. But, but I, I enjoyed the story. And, you know, the good part for me is knowing that people's action can't always change me. Mm. Just knowing I'm meant to do what is right at any point in time. And it's something to keep in mind because driving through Lagos, living in Lagos, must, it makes the most out of us. And you just wake up one day and you realize... An employee has exploited you. You're putting policies, and everybody else that is in that environment is now a suspect. Mm. Uh, the, 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 the the landlord knows the last tenant didn't move out on time. He took six months, one year, and he was going to court. So therefore, everybody else has to sign something, right? Correct. So every, we're living in a society where we're exerting. Um, everyone is becoming a suspect, and we're mm. trying to protect ourselves, and we're losing our humanness. Right. There is no ability. There is no empathy in how we relate. Even people tweeting. Sometimes you just have to know that the other person is walking a journey of challenge. And you have not walked a mile in their moccasin. Wow. So how do you think you figured it out? Well, it's something to keep in mind. Hope I'm not a monster, though. Oh, no, I don't think you are. <laughs> I, 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 the, 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 the story is humbling. Hmm. And it happens to almost all of us. Hmm. And uh, it is great courage and being deliberate not to become a monster in the society we live in. Uh, I, I was discussing with someone recently that in Nigeria, which happens almost every day, when your car is, is, is bashed by another person and you have insurance, you'd rather want to hit the person in the face than to call your insurance or to even report to the police. Mm. But it takes grace, it takes courage, mm. it takes being deliberate mm. not to allow those kind of things to affect you. I, felt, I, I, ha, I had an experience between last year, December, and now, and one of the advice of the doctor is that I should not get too emotional, I would get too angry. And I must tell you, it's not been very easy. Exactly. Anyway, why, why that, <laughs> that laughter was very telling. Because I was wondering how the doctor expected him to actually carry out a, a, a In Lagos. Doctor. I know, right? I was, <laughs> was he dreaming or did he plan for him to jack my location? <laughs> 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 so, plan B. <laughs> you know, 
<laughs> Jaffa <laughs> means relocate for you or you go watch it. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, this story reminds me of something that I ventured into a few years ago. Interestingly, in looking for, well, it wasn't, not just, it wasn't just a side hustle for me. It was really more of an, an offshoot of my upbringing and I became a certified etiquette consultant. And it was interesting that growing up, you know, and even before I went on to become that, I just thought of etiquette as, you know, how we eat, how we sit, how we engage. And it was, it was interesting to discover that in the developed world and in quite a lot of other places, maybe in homes, but not exactly in schools or in public places, behavioral etiquette, manners, how you behave, mm -hmm. how you engage with other people is actually a part of life. Mm. And what that woman obviously did was not just about being a Shylock or being a monster. It actually showed a very deep sense of lack of manners. Right. It showed that she had no integrity. Mm. Because when we think integrity, we think integrity when it comes to political offices or money or corruption issues. But integrity Even is simply mundane, keeping, day -day keeping your word. Putting, actually, in fact, in the, in, the, in the part of the training, it was there. Like, the first time I saw integrity, I was like, what? I'm, I will confess. I was like, what are they talking about? Mm. And they were like, look, you know what? Integrity is simply putting yourself in the other person's shoes. Right. And you have to look at issues of empathy and so many other things. So I believe that our society as a whole really needs to not just talk about how we're losing our humaneness and our humanity, but our society as a whole needs to go back to the drawing table. And as individuals, we need to probably start to decide to educate ourselves, our people around us, and maybe even for a lot of the political people around mm. me, because I've heard a lot about politics mm. in the last few weeks. Maybe we need to make it part of what we're doing. <laughs> yes, in, our, in all our trainings, in our mm. engagements, our, how do I make the other person feel? Mm. How do I actually hold my word? How can I be held as a person whose word is true? And which is why when we want to travel out of Nigeria or when we're even representing ourselves as Nigerians, we have a certain image. So while it may be a bad story and we're thankful that we're not monsters and I found it hard to think that when the time came for me to hire her, what would I have done? Right. But I'm, I mean, I think it's time for us to look at the general image and the final end point of where we're going to with that. But then I would have, what would I have done if I met that one and I had to hire her? I'd have given her a lesson in life, a life lesson. And I've told her exactly what it was that she did wrong. Not just in hurting me mm. or in actually creating a problem with my business at that time, but the behavioral pattern that she did, what she did right. and how she shouldn't repeat it. Oh, well, you know what they say. It's, it's, uh, it's easy for you when the shoes are not <laughs> on your feet. <laughs> Anyhow, a famous man once said, a good person can make another person good. It means that goodness will elicit goodness in society and other persons will also be good. Join us again next week on another edition of The Advocate. While The Advocacy continues on our social media platforms on Facebook plus TV Africa, hashtag The Advocate NG and Instagram at plus TV Africa, same hashtag The Advocate NG. To catch up with previous broadcasts, log on to plustvafrica.com forward slash the advocates ng. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Plus TV Africa. Join us again next week, same time on this station. Let's keep advocating for a better society. Goodbye and God bless.